2. Prisoner in the Pit We set out in late afternoon, made our way secretly through the nearer valleys during dusk, and travelled on by moonlight. We did not rest until the sun was high, and by then we were halfway along the shore of the westerly of the Twin Lakes that lay below our stronghold. We hid ourselves on the hillside, behind and far above us was the glistening white peak from which we had started our journey. We were tired. We ate and then slept, exhausted through the long hot day. It was a hundred miles to the point on the river at which we were to join the Earl Koenig. We had a guide, one of the men who knew the country from raiding parties, who would go with us as far as the barge. We went mostly by night, resting during the daylight hours. This was some weeks after the feast and Julius's announcement. During that time, we had been given further instruction and preparation, starting with having our hair cropped short and the false cap moulded to fit close to our skulls. It had been strange and desperately uncomfortable at first, but gradually I had grown used to this hard helmet of metal. My hair was already growing through and around the mesh, and we were assured that before the games began, we should look no different from other boys who had been capped in the first weeks of summer as they were here. At night we wore bonnets of wool, because otherwise the cold would strike through the metal, painfully waking us. Henry had not been among those who watched us leave the tunnel. I understood that. I would not have wanted to be there if our situations had been reversed. My impulse was to resent Fritz, who had taken his place, but I remembered what Julius had said about needing to curb my rashness. I remembered also that I had resented what I thought was the greater friendship between Beanpole and Henry on our journey south, and how I had allowed it to influence me during our stay at the Chateau de la Tourouge. I was determined not to let anything of that kind happen now, and with this in mind made a special effort to overcome my animosity and be nice to Fritz. But there was a poor response to my overtures. He remained taciturn and withdrawn. I was prepared to resent that, in turn and with more justification as I saw it, but I succeeded in bottling up my annoyance. It was a great help that Beanpole was with us. He and I did most of the talking, when we were in circumstances where talking did not involve risk. Our guide, Primo, a dark, burly man, looking clumsy but in fact wonderfully sure-footed, said little beyond what was necessary in warning and instruction. A week had been allowed for us to reach the barge, but we covered the distance in four days. We followed a high ridge skirting the ruins of one of the great cities. These encompassed a bend in the river, which was to be a thoroughfare. The river came from the east, with the early morning sun glinting along its length, but here turned and flowed northward. The higher stretch was empty, as was the part that ran between the sullen humps that had once been towering buildings, but above that there was traffic, two barges nosing down river, perhaps a dozen tied up by the bank at the wharves of a small town. Primo pointed down, one of those will be Elconic. You can find your way down there on your own. We assured him that we could go. Ah, then I'll be getting back. He nodded briefly. Good luck to you. The old Koenig was one of the smaller barges, some 50 feet in length. There was nothing special about her. She was just a long, low structure rising a few feet above the surface of the water, with a partly covered wheelhouse aft giving the steersman some protection against the elements. She had a crew of two, both false cap, the senior of them was called Ulf, a squat, barrel-chested man in his forties, with a brusque manner and a habit of punctuating his speech by spitting. I did not like him, the more so after he made a disparaging remark about my slightness of build. His companion, Moritz, was about ten years younger and, I thought, ten times pleasanter. He had fair hair, a thin face and a warm and ready smile, but there could be no doubt as to which of them was master. Moritz deferred to Ulf automatically, 
and it was Ulf spitting and grunting at regular intervals who gave us our instructions for the voyage. We're a two-man barge, he told us. An extra boy is fair enough. You start apprentices that way. But any more would draw notice, and I'm not having it. So you'll take it in turns to work on deck, and when I say work, boy, I mean it. And the other two will lie below decks and won't come up even if she's foundering. You've been told the need for discipline. I take it, so I don't need to go into that. All I want to say is this. I shall give short shrift to anyone who causes trouble, for whatever reason. I know the job you've got to do, and I hope you're up for it, but if you can't behave sensibly and obey orders on this trip, you're not likely to be any good later on. So, I won't think twice about dropping somebody off who's out of line. And since I wouldn't want him to float into the wrong harbor and start people asking questions, I've got a weight of iron to tie his legs to before I do drop him off. <clears throat> he cleared his throat, spat and growled. <clears throat> the last remark I thought was possibly meant to be a joke, and I was not sure of that. He looked quite capable of carrying out the threat. He continued. You've arrived early, which is better than arriving late. We have a cargo to load yet. And in any case, it's known that we're not due off for another three days. We can leave a day early, but no more. So for the first couple below have got a two-day stint before they see the sky again. Do you want to draw lots for it? I glanced at Beanpole. Two days on deck were vastly preferable to spending the time below. But there was possibility of two days confined with the silent Fritz. Beanpole, his mind presumably working along the same lines, said, Will and I will volunteer to stay below. Ulf looked at me and I nodded. He said, Just as you like. Show them where they bunk, Moritz. A problem that had engaged Beanpole as we came down from the hill to the riverbank had been the way in which the barges were propelled. They had no sails, and these, in any case, would have been of limited value in the confines of a river. They could go down, of course, easily enough with the current. But how had they come up to this point against it? As we got nearer, we saw that they had paddle wheels in their sides. Beanpole was excited by the thought that there might be some machine, surviving from the days of the ancients, that moved them. The truth was disappointing. Each wheel had a treadmill inside and the treadmill on journeys upriver was worked by donkeys, trained for the task when young. They strained steadily forward and their efforts pulled the larger barge through the water. It seemed a hard and dreary life and I was sorry for them, but they were well looked after by Moritz, who was plainly fond of the beasts. They were worked very little on the downriver trips and were pastured whenever there was an opportunity. They were in a field not far from the riverbank now and would stay there till it was time for the Elkenig to move on. Until they came aboard, Beanpole and I stayed in their small stables with the smell of donkey and fodder mixing with the smells of old cargoes. The cargo this time was wooden clocks and carvings the people who lived in the great forest east of the river made these, and they were shipped down river to be sold. They had to be loaded with care because of their fragility, and men came aboard the barge to see this. Beanpole and I hid behind the bales of hay that were kept for the donkeys, and did our best to stay quiet. Once I could not stop myself from sneezing, but luckily they were talking and laughing loudly enough not to hear it. It was a relief when the two days were up, and, in the early morning, the barge cast off and moved out into the river. The donkeys worked their treadmill, two at a time, with one resting, and Beanpole and I drew straws for who took Fritz's place on deck. I won, and went up to a dark, blowy day with a wind from the north that carried occasional gusts of rain. Yet the air was light and fresh after my confinement below, and there were many things to be seen on the river and around it. 
Westward there was a great fertile plain with people working in the fields. To the east the hills stood up, with the black clouds pressing down over their wooded crests. I did not have much time though to admire the scenery. Ulf called me and made me get a bucket of water, a brush and a handful of yellow, soft soap. The decks, he observed truthfully enough, had not been scrubbed for some weeks. I could make myself useful by remedying that. The progress of the Ulkenig was steady, but not fast. In the evening, before it was dark, we tied up on a long island where another barge was already moored. This was one of a number of staging posts that apparently ran the 500 mile length of the river. Moritz explained to me that they were set a distance apart, which was calculated as a minimum day's haul up river. Going down with the current, one usually covered two stages easily in a day, but to achieve a third meant risking darkness, falling before one got there. The barges did not sail by night. We had seen no sign of tripods during our journey from the White Mountains through the valleys to the river. During this day on deck, I saw two. Both were distant, striding along the western skyline, three or four miles away at least. But the sight of them gave me a shiver of fear, which took some subduing. For quite long periods, it was possible to forget the exact nature of the mission on which we had embarked, being reminded of it was a nasty jolt. I tried to console myself with the thought that there had been no hitches so far, that everything was going well. It did not help much, but by the following evening, even that small consolation had gone. The Ilkenig stopped at the halfway stage in a small town, a trading post. Moritz explained that Ulf had some business to conduct there. It would only take him an hour or so, but he had decided, since we were in advance of schedule, to stay over until the following morning. The afternoon lengthened though, and there was no sign of Ulf returning. Moritz became more and more visibly nervous. In the end he voiced his apprehensions. Ulf, it seemed, was a man who drank heavily on occasion. Moritz had thought he would not do so on this trip, in view of everything that hung on it. But if the business on which he was engaged had gone wrong and he had become irritated by that, he might have stopped at the tavern, intending to have a drink to soothe his temper, and one thing might have led to another. In a bad bout he might be away from the barge several days. This was a discouraging thought. The sun dropped down in the west and there was no Ulf. Moritz began to talk of leaving us on the barge and going in search of him. The difficulty was that the Erlkenig and Ulf and Moritz were well known in this town. Already a couple of men had stopped by to offer greetings and chat for a while. If Moritz left, Beanpole would have to handle them. It was his day on deck and Moritz was unhappy about that. Suspicions might be aroused, they were likely to quiz him in his role as a new apprentice. People on the river were curious about strangers, knowing each other so well, and he might be led into saying something that they would recognise as false. It was Beanpole who suggested another way. We boys could go and look for Ulf, choosing moments when no eye was watching, we could slip away in turn and hunt round the taverns till we found him. Then either persuade him to return or at least tell Moritz where he was. If we were questioned, we could pass as travellers from far parts. After all, the town was a trading post. It was not the same as having to answer questions about what we were doing on board the Ilkenig. Moritz was dubious, but admitted there was some point in this. Gradually, he allowed himself to be persuaded. It was out of the question for all three of us to go searching for Ulf, but one might, Beanpole, since it had been his idea. So Beanpole went, and I at once started working on Moritz to let him go also. I was helped by the fact that my opportunity was matched, on Fritz's part, by indifference. He made no comment 
and clearly was prepared to wait until things sorted themselves out without assistance from him. So, having allowed one to go, there was only one other for Moritz to consider. I wore him down as I had known I would. He was more amiable than Ulf, much more amiable, but also less sure of himself. He insisted that I should be back within the hour, whether or not I found Ulf, and I agreed to that. I was tingling with the excitement of exploring a strange town in a strange country. I checked that no one was watching the barge, then jumped quickly onto the quay and made my way along the waterfront. It was a bigger place than I had thought, looking at it from the deck of the barge. Fronting the river was a row of warehouses and granaries, many of them with three floors above ground. The buildings were partly of stone, but more of wood, and the wood was carved and painted with figures of men and animals. There were a couple of taverns in this stretch, and I looked in briefly, though Beanpole, I guess, would have covered these before me. One of them was empty except for two old men, sitting with large mugs of beer. They were called steins, I knew, and smoking pipes. The other had perhaps a dozen men in it, but I could tell in a quick survey that none of them was Ulf. I came to a road which ran at right angles to the river and followed it. There were shops here and a fair amount of horse traffic with pony traps and larger carriages and men on horseback. There were, I thought, a lot of people about. I understood why on coming to the first intersection, the crossing road in either direction was blocked by stalls that sold food and cloth and all kinds of goods. This was the town's market day. It was exhilarating. After the long winter of exercise and study in the darkness of the tunnel, or on the bare vastness of the mountainside, to be once more among people going about their daily lives, and particularly exhilarating for me, who before fleeing to the White Mountains had known only the quietness of a country village. A few times I'd been taken to Winchester for the market there, and had marvelled at it. This town seemed to be as big as Winchester, perhaps even bigger. I made my way past the stalls. The first was piled high with vegetables, carrots and little potatoes. Fat green and white spears of asparagus, peas and huge cabbages, both green and red. At the next there was meat, not simple cuts such as the butcher brought to my village in England, but joints and chops and rolls most delicately decorated with dabs of white lard. I wandered along, gazing and sniffing. One stall was completely given over to cheeses of a score of different colours, shapes and sizes. I had not realised there could be so many. And a fish stall had dried and smoked fish hanging from hooks and fish caught fresh, caught from the river and laid out along a stone slab. Their scales still wet. Now, with dusk gathering, some of the stalls were preparing to close down, but most were busy yet, and the press of people, threading their way between and past them, was thick enough. Between two stalls, one selling leather and the other bolts of cloth, I saw the opening to a tavern and guiltily remembered what I was supposed to be doing. I went inside and looked about me. It was darker than the taverns on the waterfront, full of tobacco smoke and crowded with dim figures, some sitting at tables and others standing by the bar counter. As I went up to look more closely, I was addressed from the other side of the bar. The speaker was a very big, very fat man wearing a leather jacket with sleeves of green cloth. In a rough voice with an accent that I could barely understand, he said, What is it then, lad? Moritz had given me some coins of the money used in these parts. I did what seemed the safest thing, and ordered a stein of dunkles, which I knew to be the name of the dark ale that was commonly drunk. The stein was larger than I had expected. He brought it to me, with ale foaming over the side, and I gave him a coin. 
I drank and had to wipe foam from my lips. It had a bitter, sweet taste, which was not unpleasant. I looked round for Ulf, peering into the many dark recesses whose panelled walls carried the mounted heads of deer and wild boar. I thought for a moment I saw him, but the man moved into the light of an oil lamp and was a stranger. I felt nervous. Having a cat, I was regarded as a man, so that there was no reason why I should not be here. But I lacked the assurance of someone who had been truly capped, and I was aware, of course, of my difference from all these others. Having established that Ulf was not one of the figures sprawling at the tables, I was eager to be away. As inconspicuously as possible, I put the stein down and began to move toward the street. Before I'd gone a couple of paces, the man in the leather jacket roared at me and I turned back. Here! He pushed over some smaller coins. You're forgetting your change! I thanked him and once more prepared to go. By this time, though, he had seen the stein and that it was two-thirds full. You're not drunk your ale, either! Have you got any complaint about it? I hastily said no, that it was just that I was not feeling well. To my dismay, I realised that the others had taken an interest in me. The man behind the bar seemed partly mollified, but said, you're not a Wurdenberger, by the way you talk. Where are you from, then? This was a challenge for which I had been prepared. We were to hail from outlying places, in my case a land to the south called Tyrol. I told him this. As far as a lying suspicion was concerned, it worked. From another point of view, though, it was an unfortunate choice. I learned later that there was a strong feeling in the town against the Tyrol. The previous year at the games a local champion had been defeated by a Tyroler and, it was claimed, through trickery. One of the others standing by now asked if I were going to the games and I cautiously said yes. What followed was a stream of insults. Tyrolers were cheats and braggarts and they spurned good Wuttenberg ale. They ought to be run out of town, dipped in the river to clean them up a bit. The thing to do was get out, and fast. I stomached the insults and turned to go. Once outside I could lose myself in the crowd. I was thinking of that and did not look closely enough in front of me. A leg was stretched out from one of the tables and, to the accompaniment of a roar of laughter, I went sprawling in the sawdust that covered the floor. Even that I was prepared to endure, though I had banged one knee painfully as I landed. I began to get to my feet. As I did so, fingers gripped the hair that grew up through my cap, shook my head violently to and fro, and thrust me down once more to the ground. I should have been thankful that this assault had not dislodged the false cap and exposed me. I should also have been concentrating on what really mattered getting away from here and safely and unnoticed back to the barge. But I am afraid that I could think of nothing but the pain and humiliation. I got up again, saw a face grinning behind me and swung at him in fury. He was probably a year or so older than I was and bigger and heavier. He fended me off contemptuously. My mind did not cool down enough for me to realise how stupidly I was behaving but enough for the skills I had acquired during my long training to take over. I fainted towards him and, as he swung a still casual arm in my direction, slipped inside and belted him hard over the heart. Now it was his turn to go sprawling, and there was a roar from the men crowding round us. He got up slowly, his face angry. The others moved back, forming a ring, clearing the tables to do so. I realised I had to go through with it. I was not afraid of that, but I could appreciate my own folly. I had been warned about my rashness by Julius, and now, within a week of starting out on an enterprise of such desperate importance, it had already betrayed me. He rushed at me, and I had to concern myself again with what was present and immediate. I sidestepped and hit him as he went past. Although he was bigger than I was, he was lacking in skill. I could have danced round him for as long as I liked, cutting him to pieces. 
but that would not do at all. What was needed was one disabling blow. From every point of view, the sooner this was over, the better. So the next time he attacked, I rode his punch with my left shoulder, sank my right fist into his vulnerable area just under his ribs, and, stepping back, caught him with as powerful a left hook as I could manage as. Gulping air, his head involuntarily came forward. I got a lot of strength into it. He went backward even faster and hit the floor. The men watching were silent. I looked at my fallen opponent and, seeing that he showed no signs of getting up, moved in the direction of the door, expecting that the ring would open to let me through. But that did not happen. They stared at me sullenly without budging. One of them knelt beside the prone figure. He said, He hit his head! He may be hurt badly! Someone else said, You ought to get the police! A few hours later, I stared up at the stars, bright in a clear black sky. I was cold and hungry, miserable and disgusted with myself. I was a prisoner in the pit. I had met very rough justice at the hands of the magistrate who had examined me. The fellow I had knocked out was a nephew of his, a son of a leading merchant in the town. The evidence was that I had provoked him in the tavern by saying things derogatory of the Württembergers, and that I had then hit him when he was not looking. It bore no resemblance at all to what had happened, but there were a number of witnesses who agreed on the story. My opponent, to give him possible credit, was not one of these, the reason being that he had suffered a concussion when his head hit the floor. He was in no state to say anything to anybody. I was warned that if he failed to recover, I would assuredly be hanged. Meanwhile, I was to be consigned to the pit during the magistrate's pleasure. This was their preferred way of dealing with malefactors. The pit was round, some 15 feet across and about as many feet deep. The floor was of rough flagstones, and the walls were also lined with stones. They were smooth enough to discourage attempts at climbing up, and there were iron spikes near the top, projecting inward, which further discouraged thoughts of escape. I'd been dropped over these like a sack of potatoes and left. I had been given no food and had nothing to cover me in a night that looked as though it was going to be cold. I had banged my elbow and grazed my arm in the fall. But the real fun, as I had been told with satisfaction by some of my captors, would take place the following day. The pit was designed partly for punishment, partly for the amusement of the local people. It was their custom to stand at the top and pelt the unfortunate prisoner with whatever came to hand or mind. Filth of all kinds, rotting vegetables, slops, that sort of thing, were what they chiefly preferred. But if they were really annoyed, they might use stones, billets of wood or broken bottles. In the past, prisoners had sometimes been severely injured, even killed. They appeared to get a lot of pleasure out of the prospect and out of telling me about it. I suppose it was something that the skies had cleared. There was no protection here from the elements. By the wall was a trough with water in it. Although I was thirsty, I was not yet thirsty enough to drink it. There had been enough light when I was first thrown down to see that it was covered by a greenish scum. No food was provided to those in the pit. When they got sufficiently hungry, they would eat the rotten refuse, bones and stale bread that were hurled at them. That too was supposed to be amusing. What a fool I'd been. I shivered and cursed my idiocy. And shivered again. Gradually the night wore through. A couple of times I lay down, curled myself up and tried to sleep, but it was growing colder, and I had to get up again and walk about to restore my circulation. I longed for the day and dreaded it at the same time. I wondered what had happened to the others, whether Ulf had got back yet. I knew there was no hope of him intervening on my behalf. 
He was quite well known in the town, but he dared not take the risk of associating with me. Tomorrow they would go downriver, leaving me here. There was nothing else they could do. The wide circle of sky above me brightened, and I could tell which side faced east by the softer light there. For a change I sat with my back to the stone wall. Tiredness, despite the cold, crept over me. My head nodded to my chest, then a sound overhead jerked me into wakefulness. I saw a face peering down, it was a small silhouette against the paling dawn. An early riser, I thought drearily, impatient to get at the victim. It would not be long before the throwing started. Then, a voice called quietly down. Will, are you alright? Beanpole's voice. He had brought a length of rope from the barge. He stretched down and tied it to one of the iron spikes, then tossed the other end to me. I grabbed it and hauled myself up. The spikes took some negotiating, but Beanpole was able to get a hand over them to help me. In a matter of seconds, I was heaving myself and being hauled over the edge of the pit. We wasted no time in discussing our situation. The pit was on the outskirts of the town, which, sleeping still but outlined now in the clear light of dawn, stood between us and the place where the Ilkenig was moored. I had only a hazy recollection of being brought here the previous evening, but Beanpole ran confidently and I followed him. It took us about ten minutes to come within sight of the river, and we had seen only one man in the distance, who shouted something but did not attempt to follow our fleeing figures. Beanpole, I realised, had timed things perfectly. We passed the street where the market had been. In another fifty yards, we should be on the quay. We reached it and turned left, about as far again along, just past the tavern next to the barge called Siegfried, I stared and stopped, and Beanpole did the same. The Siegfried was there, all right, but the berth next to her was empty. Beanpole, after a moment, plucked my sleeve. I looked where he indicated in the opposite direction to the north. The Ilkenig was out in midstream, beating down river a quarter of a mile off, a toy boat rapidly diminishing in the distance. 